Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella here from Maple University. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Nemesis. After this video, you'll be ready to play the game. Stay tuned. Let's learn to play Nemesis, game designed by Adam Kvapinski and published by Rebel Studio. If you find value from this video later, please hit the like button. Subscribe to us, hit the bell and leave your feedback in the comments for others to find. For now, let's get to the table. Nemesis is a game of survival, terror and semi-cooperative teamwork on a stricken spaceship infested with intruders. The game has no single winner or loser. Each player begins the game with two objectives and early in the game must settle on one to resolve. The player wins by completing that objective and by surviving the journey back to Earth, either in hibernation or by escape pod. Each player who achieves these two outcomes wins the game. But be warned, not all objectives are compatible. I won't step you through setup for the game, but I'll show you what the board looks like after setup. And this is the basic side of the board. There are 16 face down room tiles, 11 of them around the outer ring marked with the number one and five marked with the number two. You'll always be using every number one room that comes with the game, but there'll be some number twos left over. At the front of the ship is the cockpit, including a face down coordinates card showing where the ship is presently headed. At the rear is the three engines, with the top tile in each stack showing whether that engine is damaged or working. On the sides are the evacuation pods A and B. But note that this doesn't reflect their physical position on the ship. These A pods, for example, are actually located next to the evacuation section A room, which you'll have to find during the game. At the bottom is the round tracker, and the self-destruct sequence, which is fortunately not yet active. You'll set up a cloth bag containing tokens representing the different intruders in the game. There's one blank, and then in order from smallest to largest, the larva, creepers, adults, breeders, and the queen. Leftover tokens are kept in stacks nearby for later use. To set up the players, each player gets a player number and two objectives one personal and one corporate, which are kept secret. With knowledge of the objectives, players now draft their characters. You'll then take your character's components, your deck of action cards, which are shuffled face down, your starting item, which is placed into one of your hands and loaded up with its starting ammo cubes, and two quest items on the face down side. Player one gets the first player token for the first round. And note that while first player will rotate from round to round, these ID numbers will not. Which is important for objective cards that refer to a specific player ID. Player minis, plus this token representing a dead comrade, start in the hibernarium. Nearby you'll have all the other components you need to play the game. Different decks of cards and piles of tokens. And note that your deck of contamination cards will look like action cards on the back. You're now ready to play. Nemesis plays in a maximum of 15 rounds, and each round plays in two phases, the player phase and the event phase. The player phase takes place in turns, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table. On a turn, you will take two actions, and each of your actions will either come from one of your action cards or require you to pay a cost by discarding action cards. If you take only one or zero actions on your turn, then you must pass, and you're out of the rest of this phase. Then follows the event phase, where intruders will attack characters in the same room, then intruders suffer fire damage, then you'll draw and resolve an event, which means first moving intruders, and then resolving the text effect, and finally, you'll draw a token from the bag and resolve its effect. To win the game, you must complete your objective and survive back to Earth. You begin the game with two objectives and you will discard one of them, thereby choosing the one you want to complete, immediately the first time any intruder mini is placed on the board. There are two ways to survive and get back to Earth. 
The first on the main ship is to go into hibernation with the ship's coordinates set to Earth and make sure the ship is not destroyed. And the ship can be destroyed if at least two out of the three engines is damaged at the end of the game. The self-destruct sequence reaches zero or is active at the end of the game. Or if at any point you would place a ninth fire token or a ninth malfunction token on the board at once. The other way to survive is in an escape pod. And if you can get into one of these, then this will always take you back to Earth but you'll need to first unlock one, which can happen with a key, or automatically when a player dies, or the self-destruct sequence reaches three. All of this is designed to create conflict between players who want to escape on the pods versus those who want to survive with the ship. Finally, beware that even if you meet these conditions, you're still at risk if you've gained contamination from your interactions with the intruders. Too much contamination and there's a chance that you'll die on your way back to Earth. Now we'll take a closer look at the player phase and in particular we'll have a look at the actions which represent the basic actions you can take on the ship, such as moving, attacking and so on. The more specific actions related to the narrative or your objectives we'll come back to towards the end of the video. The first thing all players do in the player phase is draw up to five cards in hand from the action deck. Shuffle your discard pile into a new draw deck if you run out. Then except in round one, pass the first player marker one step clockwise. Now players take turns and on your turn you must take two actions and there are lots of different sources of actions. Basic actions printed on your player board, actions printed on your cards, the actions printed on the action cards in your hand, and the action printed on the room tile in your current room. A character who shares a room with at least one intruder is said to be in combat, and one that doesn't is out of combat. And there are certain actions restricted to only being done in combat or out of combat. Some show these icons while some do not. Every action you take has an action point cost, which is shown in this white square. And this is paid by discarding that number of non-contamination cards from your hand to your discard pile. If the action comes from a single use item or one of your action cards, then you must discard the card in question as well as the action card cost. So this one here for two action points requires this card plus two others. As your hand runs down, this limits the actions you can take in each round. So now let's look at some key actions, starting with movement. Movement costs one action point. And this results in four main steps. First, moving your pawn. Second, revealing the new room, if it was previously unexplored. Thirdly, rolling for noise. And finally, resolving an encounter with the intruders if dictated by the noise roll. So let's review each step of this. Firstly, you can move down any corridor to an adjacent room unless that corridor is blocked by a closed door token. All doors are open at the start of the game, meaning their token is not on the board. Next, if the room you enter is unexplored, then you will reveal the room and reveal and resolve the exploration tile. If either shows the slime icon, then add a slime marker to the board if there's not one there already. This icon represents the number of items that can be found in the room, and so rotate the room until the same number on the outer edge points to the item arrow. Then resolve the other icon before discarding it. This would mean you'd place a malfunction token. This means place a fire token. And this means that in the corridor you pass through, the door shuts behind you. Next is rolling for noise. If you entered a room containing another character, an intruder, or had an escalation token showing silence, then you do not roll. Otherwise, you'll roll the noise die once. On a roll of silence, nothing happens. On the roll of a number, which will be between one and four, 
place a noise token in the corridor corresponding to the number. If the rolled corridor shows this red dot, then you place the noise in the technical corridors, that is the ductwork that connects many of the rooms all across the ship. And if you ever roll a corridor which already has a noise marker in it, then this triggers an encounter. First, discard all noise from corridors adjacent to that room, including the technical corridor. Then draw an intruder token from the bag. If it's blank, you'll return it to the bag and then put noise back onto all the corridors in this room. Again, including the technical corridor if applicable. If you draw an intruder, then place the matching type of intruder mini into your room. Then check the reverse side of the token. If your current hand size, including contamination, meets or exceeds this number, then nothing else happens. But if it's less, then the intruder attacks you immediately in a surprise attack. Surprise attacks work exactly like regular attacks, which we'll describe later in the video. This means you're at greater risk of being attacked later in the round when you have fewer cards. And do also note that you can do noise rolls during the event phase after you've passed for the round, and this can be a reason to keep some cards in hand. Either way, after the encounter, the token is placed with the rest of the spare tokens. If you roll danger, or if you draw danger, or if you're currently slimed and you roll or draw silence, then all intruders in adjacent rooms who are not already in combat with another character will move into your room. This never triggers an automatic attack, but do remember that they'll attack you when the event phase comes around. If no intruders move when you resolve danger, then fill up all of the corridors in that room with noise, the same way you would for drawing a blank tile in an encounter. And so that summarizes the basic movement action. You'll move along an open corridor, discover the new room if applicable, and resolve the exploration tile. Roll for noise if you enter a room with no intruder or character. And resolve an encounter if you make a second noise appear on the same corridor. If you are not in combat, then for two action points instead of one, you can do a careful movement. This works the same as normal movement, except that instead of rolling for noise, you choose the noise result between one and four. Finally, if you are in combat, then to move you must escape. This works like a normal one action point movement, except that the intruder attacks you before you start the movement sequence. Once again, we'll describe how attacks work in the event phase of the video. Next we'll talk about actions and rules related to carrying objects and items. In the game, objects are represented by these circular tokens which you can find on the board, while all items are represented by these small cards. An item with this icon, a hand carrying a handle, is called a heavy item, and it must be held in one of your two hands. Objects are also considered heavy, and if you carry one, it occupies a hand slot too. Meanwhile, you can carry as many non-heavy items as you'd like, and you cannot show them to your opponents. You can put them into this card tray, or hold them privately in your hand. There are four decks of items in the game, military, medical, technical, and crafted. These three are shuffled while these are not. As an out of combat action, by playing a search card from your hand, you can search your current room for an item. As long as your room's item counter is greater than zero. A coloured room produces only items in its colour. A white room allows you to search for items of one chosen colour. Excluding blue. Take two items from the corresponding deck, look at them, and then choose the one you wish to keep, placing the other on the bottom of the deck, equipping your new item as appropriate, and rotating the item counter down in your room. If the item you found was heavy, it goes in a hand slot, and if it was a weapon, it starts loaded with one ammo. For one action point as an out of combat action, you can pick up a heavy object from the floor of your current room placing it in your hand. As a free action at any time, you can drop an item or object. If you drop an object, it goes on the floor of your current room, and if you drop an item, it goes to the bottom of its deck, or out of the game if it has no deck. 
For one action point as a non-combat action, you can craft an item, according to one of the recipes shown here. Discard two items to the bottoms of their decks, which show the icons corresponding to that crafting recipe, and then take the matching item from the crafted items deck. As an out of combat action for one action point, a player may complete one of their two quests. These are unique challenges and items for each character. Here for example, the scout would need to go to the cockpit and then spend an action point there in order to activate this item, flipping it over to become a security key. All quests turn into items that that player may take when they're completed, some light and some heavy. As a non-combat action for one action point, a player may initiate trades in their room. Once trade is initiated, any or all players in that room may swap items between each other. Any types of items can be exchanged, and if you exchange a weapon, any ammo that's already loaded into it goes along with it. Because most of these are energy weapons which are powered up, you're never allowed to exchange already loaded ammo between weapons or players. You can use the action on a one use only card, and often this will also have an action card cost, before you discard the item. This resolves the action on the card, and remember that it may be limited to out of combat, in combat, or no icon, meaning you can do it in either. The last action associated with an item is the first action associated with attack, and that is shoot. Shooting is a combat action, it costs one action point, and it requires you to have a weapon in hand with at least one ammo. To take the action, spend one of the ammo. And if there are multiple intruders in your room, choose which one you're going to attack. Then roll a single combat die. A blank is a miss. The creeper result, for which there are two, hits creepers and smaller. The adult hits adults and smaller. The one hit hits everything, and the two hits hits everything twice. Your weapon may give you the ability to modify the roll or the number of hits dealt. If you deal any hit to a lava, then it is killed, and remove it from the board without a trace. For all other intruders, place one injury cube per hit, then draw intruder attack cards, one for a creeper or adult, and two for a breeder or queen. If the total number of injury cubes meets or exceeds the sum of all numbers drawn on these cards, then the intruder is dead. Remove it, as well as any cubes, and replace with an intruder carcass token. If any retreat icons were drawn, then the intruder survives and will move away. Flip the top event card and move down the matching numbered corridor. This works the same as event phase movement, so we'll see a few more rules around that later in the video. Any other result, and the intruder remains, keeping its injuries for the next battle. You always draw new attack cards each time you deal an injury, meaning you'll never know exactly how many wounds are needed to defeat an intruder. A weapon with no ammo can't be shot, so you'll need to recharge it, perhaps by spending an item, or perhaps loading up in the armory. Another somewhat dangerous option if you're out of ammo is to attempt a melee attack which is a combat action requiring one action point. Coming in direct physical contact with the intruders gives you a risk of being infected, so you always draw a contamination card into your discard pile. As we've seen, these can choke up your hand and they can come back to kill you at the end of the game, but we'll go into that in more detail later. Then you roll one combat die as usual. This symbol does only one hit instead of the usual two, and if you fail to hit, so for example, if you roll this while fighting a breeder, then you suffer a serious wound. Again, more on those later, but as you can see, melee attacks are particularly dangerous ways to fight the intruders. We'll finish this section with some of the other key actions which help you to move around and navigate the ship. We'll come back and talk about how all the individual rooms work in the later part of the video. However, no room will work if it has a malfunction token on it. As a non-combat action, you can use a repairs card from your hand to remove a malfunction token from your room. Doors can sometimes prove quite disruptive to your planned movement, and there are cards which will allow you to open or close doors in corridors connected to your room. 
To close a door, you'll place the door token, making that corridor impassable, and to open it, you'll take the token off. A closed corridor still generates noise in the normal way, and is considered noisy on both sides of the door. Another way to deal with a troublesome door is to destroy it using a demolition card. A demolished door is tipped on its side. It's now considered open and can never be closed again. Demolition can also be used to add a malfunction marker to your room if it doesn't have one. If all eight malfunctions have been placed and someone goes to place a ninth for any reason, then the ship explodes. Remember, not all players are interested in having the ship survive this game. Finally, each player has an interruption card which can be played out of turn to cancel the action that another player in the same room has just taken. This lets you directly sabotage opponents whose objectives don't match with your own, but do note that these can be interrupted by the player's own interruption card. We'll come back to the rest of the player actions later, and now we'll talk about how to finish the player phase and move into the event phase. When you end a turn, having taken any actions or passed on that turn, if you are in a room with fire, then you suffer one light wound. Play then passes to the next player clockwise who has not previously passed. On the first turn you take without two actions, you will pass. You can then optionally discard any number of cards from your hand, including contamination cards, but remember that you may be doing noise checks during the event phase, and so it can be helpful to keep some action cards to avoid surprise attacks. Once all players have passed, you'll move straight to the event phase. To start each event phase, advance the time track. And if self-destruct is active, advance that as well. If either track reaches the end, the game is over. Next, each intruder which shares a room with at least one character attacks one character. It will target the character with fewer cards in hand or earlier in turn order if tied. I'll now describe how intruders attack and these rules apply to surprise attacks and escape attacks as well. If the attacker is creeper or larger, then draw one intruder attack card. If the attacker's icon is not shown here, then nothing happens. If it is shown here, then you'll resolve the text against the target. A target may suffer wounds, either light or serious. For a light wound, either place a marker on the top space, or move the marker down one space on this wound track. For a serious wound, take the top serious wound card from the deck and flip it face up. This is an ongoing negative effect which impacts your character. Every third light wound you suffer results in a serious wound. Wounds can be healed by a variety of medical rooms and items, but most serious wounds have to be healed in two parts. First they must be dressed, which results in the wound being flipped over to this side. It still counts as a serious wound, but it no longer has its negative effect. Then other effects will allow you to heal a dressed serious wound, returning it to the deck. However, if at any point during the game you have three serious wounds, dressed or undressed, and you then gain one more wound of any kind, then you are dead. Remove your mini from the board and replace it with a red carcass token, as well as dropping any heavy objects you are carrying. The first time the ship's AI detects a player's death, then as a precaution it automatically unlocks all of the escape pods. This is one of three ways to unlock them in the game. Other consequences of being attacked include being slimed, gaining contamination cards into your discard pile, or creepers evolving into breeders. When a lava attacks, it automatically infects you. Remove the lava from the board, and if you don't already have one there, add the lava to your player board. If you do, simply discard the lava. You'll also gain one contamination card as a result of a lava attack. Again, all of this is leading towards the character being infected and invaded by these intruders, but we'll come back to exactly how it works later. After the attacks are done, each intruder who is in a room that's on fire suffers one injury. Check all injured intruders for death or retreat. Then draw and resolve an event card. First you'll do intruder movement. Each matching type of intruder who is not already in a room with a character moves along this numbered corridor. 
Here, all the adults move on too. This one doesn't move because it's already in combat with a player, but this one moves along too to the hibernarium. Intruders can move to unexplored rooms, so this one moves here, waiting for it to be explored or to move off again. Intruder movements are blocked by closed doors, and in this instance, the intruder will try to move along too, but will instead stay where it is and destroy the door. And if the intruder's movement takes it into the technical corridor, then it disappears into the ducts of the ship and is removed from the board. Take a random matching token type and return it to the bag. It hasn't been killed, it can still come back into play later. Then resolve the text effect. There's a variety of different effects, most of them bad, which can include attracting more intruders, spreading fire or malfunction, and a variety of others. Finally, you'll do the intruder bag development, where you'll draw one tile from the bag and resolve an effect based on what you drew. Be clear that this is a randomizer effect. It's not going to bring this intruder onto the board. It's going to resolve an effect, usually before putting this back in the bag. If you draw the blank, you'll return it with a new adult token to the bag. If you draw a lava, you'll remove that token and replace it with an adult. If you draw a creeper, you'll remove it and replace it with a breeder. If you draw an adult or a breeder, each player not currently in combat will do a noise roll in turn order, before the token is returned to the bag. This is where keeping those action cards in hand can be helpful, because a surprise attack could come from that noise roll. Finally, if the queen is drawn, then check whether there are any characters in the nest. If there are, then put the queen there and resolve an encounter. If not, then the queen lays one more egg in the nest, which you'll do by taking one of the spare eggs and placing it on the intruder board in this eggs in the nest section. If the queen was not on the board at the end of the action, put the queen token back in the bag. Now we'll have a look at all the actions that the different rooms will do, in particular the ones which drive the narrative of the game. If you remember from setup, all of the ones around the outer ring of the board are labelled number one and those are always in the game. The five in the middle come from nine number two tiles, of which only five are used. Room actions have an action point cost and all of them are out of combat actions. Additionally, some of them have this computer icon and this combines with some specific actions in the game. Here, for example, using a room with a computer. I'll start with the most basic rooms and then get into the ones which drive the narrative and the objectives. At the armory, you can add two ammo to an energy weapon. The storage room contains unlimited items. But when you use your search action card, it will cost you just that card and you'll still rotate this looking for military items. While when taking the room action, it will cost you two cards and you can choose which deck you want to search through. The fire control system lets you put out one fire in any one room. Any intruders in that room are startled and will move based on one draw of an event card. The emergency room is the best place to treat your wounds letting you dress all of your serious wounds, or heal one dressed serious wound, or heal all of your light wounds. Among the inner ring rooms are the command center, which lets you open or close any number of doors in a single room, airlock control, which can block off a single other yellow room and depressurize it, flushing everything into space and killing it, if they're unable to get a door open by the end of this player phase. The cabins, which grant you a sixth card if you start the round there. And the monitoring room, which lets you peek at another tile and its exploration. The next rooms and actions relate to contamination and infection by lava. As we've hinted previously, these cards are nothing but trouble. They choke up your hand, giving you fewer action cards to play and they represent the intruders trying to impregnate you with their eggs. If you have one of these lava tokens on your player board, you've been infected. All of these provide different ways that your player might be killed. There are two different types of contamination cards, infected and non-infected, and you can only see the difference through a red filtered scan. You'll need to look closely, but if none of the five lines say infected, then the card is fine. 
but if one of the five lines says infected, then it is an infected card. About a quarter of the cards are infected, and you can only scan if you get an action which lets you do a scan. The infected cards are the ones that will kill you, and the single safest way to deal with that is at the surgery. With surgery, you can remove a larva from your player board if you have one, and you can go through your entire hand, draw deck, and discard pile, find all contamination cards, scan them, and then remove any infected ones from the game. Then any cards you have left over are all shuffled back together into a new draw deck. You suffer one light wound and you pass immediately. In this way, surgery makes sure you're absolutely free of infections, but it does nothing to deal with the other contamination cards which are choking up your deck and hand. Very similar to this is the antidote crafted item, the only difference being that instead of suffering a light wound, you gain one contamination card after the action is done. Alcohol is the other way to deal with infection. You scan one card from your hand, and then if it is infected, you can remove it from the game and replace it with another random one from the deck. Those three actions only deal with the infections. They don't deal with the huge amount of contamination cards which might be choking up your hand. One action you can take to deal with that is the rest card. This lets you scan any contamination cards in your hand and any that are not infected you can remove from the game. But if you scan any infected cards then you gain a larva, as well as keeping the infection card. If doing this would cause you to gain a second larva, then your character dies and evolves into a creeper. Two inner ring rooms give you a similar option. At the canteen, you can take a snack to heal one light wound and may then optionally rest. In the shower room, you can take a shower to remove slime from your player board and then optionally take one rest. Do it at the wrong time and it could be the last snack or the last shower you ever take. Be aware that you can't avoid this risk just by not taking a rest, as there is an event, the Eclosion, which will instantly kill any players who have a larva. But do remember that an attack from a larva can only cause the first larva to be placed on a player's player board. This attack would not cause death and the larva would simply be discarded. The remaining rooms all relate to completing objectives or surviving the game. First we can see the nest which contains eggs, as presently shown on the intruder board. For two action points, you can pick up an egg from the nest and then do a noise roll. As a non-combat action, you can spend one action point to either shoot or do a melee attack against the eggs. Each injury of any size destroys one egg, and the attempt must once again be followed by a noise roll. If the nest is on fire, then one egg is destroyed in each intruder fire damage phase, and if the nest runs out of eggs, it is destroyed. It could have eggs again later in the game, but it is always now considered destroyed for the purposes of objectives. There are several objective reasons you might want to do this. Your objective might be to destroy the nest, or to do something with an egg. The laboratory allows players to analyse heavy objects to find weaknesses in the intruders. For two action points, a player with the appropriate object type can reveal that weakness without consuming the object. So if you have an intruder carcass, you would reveal this. An intruder egg would reveal the middle one. And a character corpse, which can be that blue starting corpse or the corpse of another player, reveals this one. These were placed at random during setup, and once they're revealed, it makes the intruders weaker for the rest of the game. Additionally, some objectives want these to have been discovered. In the comms room, you can spend two action points to send a signal, which is required for some objectives. A player whose objective is to send a signal must personally send a signal. They can't rely on another player's signal. At the generator, you can spend two action points to initiate the self-destruct sequence, placing this marker on the six. At the start of each event phase going forward, this will move one step to the right. If this marker is yet to pass the middle point, then a player can spend two action points to cancel the self-destruct sequence. However, this option ceases to be available once the marker reaches three. As soon as this space is crossed, 
all of the evacuation pods are instantly unlocked. To win the game, each player must get safely home back to Earth, and there are two ways to do it. The first is in the Hibernarium, and to survive there, the ship must be headed to Earth, and at least two out of the three engines must be working. At the cockpit, you can spend two action points to look at the coordinates card, and this will tell you which of A, B, C, and D corresponds to which planet. Here, Earth is D. You must look secretly. You can't show the card to other players, and you can tell them whatever you want. Alternatively, you can spend two action points to adjust the destination. This makes sure the ship is heading where you want it to go, because not everyone will necessarily want to go to Earth. Each of the three engines has one working and one damaged tile, and whichever one is on top is the current status of the engine. At an engine room, you can spend two action points to secretly have a look. And from an engine room with the appropriate repairs card, you can look at these and then rearrange them in whichever configuration you want, either fixing or breaking the engine. The inner rings engine control room lets you secretly look at all three engines remotely. As for the coordinates card, the engines can only be looked at or rearranged secretly, but you can tell your opponents whatever you want. Finally, you can attempt to go back into hibernation, and this becomes available only after round 8. Spend two action points, then attempt a noise roll. If no intruders arrive as a result of this roll, then you enter hibernation, and you take no further part in the game. Still, this is no guarantee that you'll survive back to Earth, as there are still other ways, such as the self-destruct sequence, that the ship could explode with you on it. However, you're not completely powerless, since as soon as any player is in hibernation, the ship's AI prevents the destination from being changed again, and prevents a new self-destruct sequence from being activated. The other means of safe escape is in an escape pod, and these are pre-programmed to go to Earth, so you'll always get to Earth if you take one of these. The pods begin the game locked, and they automatically unlock the first time a player is killed, or when the self-destruct sequence goes down to three. All these should be flipped over to the unlocked side when this happens. There's also the inner ring room hatch control, which lets you lock or unlock pods remotely, as well as some other specific items. And these can be used to lock a pod, even if one of the automatic opening effects has already occurred. Entering a pod works the same way as entering the hibernarium. Do a noise roll, and then if no intruders arrive, jump into one of the pods in the matching lettered bay. When you enter a pod, you may launch it immediately, meaning you're returning safe to Earth and you take no further part in the game. But you may choose not to launch immediately, perhaps if you want a specific player to survive. If you choose not to launch, then the only time you can launch in future is at the start of your first turn of each round. If you don't launch, you may choose to exit the pod and go back to the evacuation section, but whether you do this or not, you immediately pass. While waiting in a pod, you automatically leave the pod if an intruder ever enters the matching evacuation bay. That's all the rules you need to know to play Nemesis, and we'll quickly now revise the sequence of the game and how to go through the end of the game. To begin the game, players are woken up in the Hibernarium, with two objectives, a personal and a corporate. The objectives and other secret information in the game is strictly secret. You cannot show other players the cards, although you can tell them whatever you want about them. The first time any intruder mini is added to the board, each player discards one of them, having only one secret objective thereafter. A player wins the game by completing this objective and surviving safe home to Earth. The first way to survive is with the ship. You must enter the Hibernarium after round 8, have the ship's destination set to Earth, and make sure the ship survives. Things which will make the ship explode are two or more of its three engines being damaged at the end of the game, the self-destruct sequence either finishing or being active at the end of the game, or if there is ever a need to place a ninth fire token or a ninth malfunction token during the game. 
If any of these happens, then the ship is destroyed and everything and everyone on it is destroyed or killed for the purposes of your objectives. Your second way to get back to Earth is to unlock and escape on an escape pod. The game ends immediately when all players are either dead, in hibernation, or escaped on an escape pod. Or if the round marker reaches this space, in which case any players who are still walking around the ship are killed when the spaceship goes into hyperjump. At this point you'll reveal the engines and reveal the destination. If the engines fail then the ship explodes, while if the destination is not Earth, the ship survives but any players in hibernation die. Finally, the intruders may have one more twist for any players who've survived this far. Some players may already be infected, having a lava on their board. All others must scan any contamination cards they have in their deck or discard pile, and if they have any infected cards among them, then they too are infected. Infected players shuffle their discard and draw piles back together. Then draw four cards. If any contamination cards are drawn during those four cards, then the player succumbs and dies on the way home to Earth. But if you draw four clean cards, then you've survived. Finally, and only now, it's time to check your objective cards, based on everything that has exploded and every character that's died during this endgame sequence. If you survived, and you met your objective, then you are one of the winners of the game. All that remains is to look at some of the game's objectives, so you know what your opponents might be targeting. These ones require either a specific character not to survive, or for that player to be the only survivor. And you'll have to go for this one if you draw your own player number with that objective. You can never directly attack another player, but there are plenty of ways to influence their story towards a death. Some require ship actions like sending the signal, or discovering specific weaknesses, and these don't have to be discovered by the player, they just have to be discovered. Some require you to survive with a certain object, like an egg or the blue character corpse, or hoarding seven items. Some are all about destruction, destroy the nest, destroy the queen, or destroy the ship. One quester wants to make sure every room is explored. One needs to make sure at least one other player survives. There's a couple who just need the ship to reach Earth, and even one who wants it to reach Mars. This player's objective is an exception to the base rules, as this player can survive in the Hibernarium on Mars. Not all objectives are used at all player counts, and you'll use these icons here. The game comes with a solo or fully cooperative mode, which uses a different set of objectives. And there's also a special set of action cards, which allows the first eliminated player to take on the role of intruders for the rest of the game. And this will help you if one of your players has been eliminated early. There's also a more difficult and advanced side of the board, which features two separate technical corridors, red and blue, but otherwise plays the same as the base game. And that's how to play Nemesis. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.